This is More Perfect, Season 3. That right there, what you're hearing are the Kaminas, a South Asian American punk band that chose the Ninth Amendment. You can hear the whole song at themostperfectalbum.org. We have released an album, as I have mentioned in the past two episodes. We're really excited. We made this album called 27, The Most Perfect Album, where we asked a bunch of musicians to write a song that interprets one of the amendments to the U.S. Constitution. Bunch of different artists participated. Again, you can hear the whole thing at themostperfectalbum.org or on iTunes, Spotify, all the stuff. On the podcast, we are um, releasing what I like to think of as audio liner notes uh, to the songs. These short little stories that illuminate some aspect of the amendment. Now, the first eight amendments were very clear. Right to free speech. Right to bear arms. Third amendment, whatever. Whatever. But then, you know, you get to the amendments that talk about the rights you have when you are arrested by the police. Super matter of fact, concrete. But then, things get spacey, unhinged, untethered. Especially when you get to the next three. Ninth Amendment, Tenth Amendment, Eleventh Amendment. These three amendments... They're a little bit trippy. Not to say they're not important. Some people would argue they're the most important amendments, but it's just that they're very hard to understand by just reading the text. You kind of have to talk about them by talking about something else, if that makes any sense. So that's what we're going to do. Play the songs in just a second, but for the moment, for the liner notes, we're going to try and use metaphor to bring these spacey amendments back down to earth, starting with... Ninth Amendment. The Ninth. Non-enumerated rights retained by people. The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. Hmm, yeah. Listen to it one more time. The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. So, I've been reading about the Ninth Amendment. More perfect producer Kelly Prime. And learning that basically... The reason it's around is because the framers wanted to cover their asses. Our asses. Basically, the ninth looks back at the previous eight amendments and it says, Yeah, those are our rights, but they aren't our only rights. We've got way more rights than that that just aren't written down. Which I guess makes sense, but does it? I mean, we can pretty much choose to do anything that isn't illegal, But there are lots of things that aren't constitutional guarantees. I mean, what counts? If we have boundless Ninth Amendment rights, why don't we have a guaranteed right to marijuana? Or free refills? To window seats? The right to complimentary dinner mints? The right to tasting tiny pieces of candy out of those bulk containers? The right to ice cream for breakfast? Every day? It's just like, it's super vague, and I wanted to know how to understand it better, so I started Googling whatever I could, and I came across a professor. This is Judith Baer. From Texas A&M University. I teach political science, and I specialize in public law. And Judith told me about a case. Called Griswold versus Connecticut. The story of Griswold versus Connecticut begins in 1961. Okay, Estelle Griswold was the executive director of the Planned Parenthood League of Connecticut. Uh, Estelle got together with a Yale med school gynecologist named C. Lee Buxton, and the two of them started a clinic in New Haven. They were quite popular in the community. They had lots of clients, and within 10 days, the police shut them down. Because keep in mind, this was before Roe v. Wade. 
And in Connecticut in the mid-60s... The law prohibited the use of any contraception. It was illegal to even use birth control, so it was super illegal to start a clinic where you coach women and married couples about it. But Estelle Griswold was doing it anyway. Well, I think it's very evident that the law is unenforceable. I think if you had a policeman under every bed in the state of Connecticut, they still could not prove anything. This is tape of Estelle Griswold from that time. We are continuing, maybe illegally, but we are continuing our program. So in the late fall of 1961... November, we issued two warrants, one against Estelle Griswold and the other against Dr. C. Lee Buxton. Estelle Griswold and Dr. C. Lee Buxton are arrested. In violation of the contraceptive statute. What happens next is their clinic gets shuttered. They go to court. Their case makes it all the way up to the Supreme Court. And eventually they win in a way that feels both very obvious and incredibly odd. Also, like, somewhat metaphysical. In the opinion, William O. Douglas, the justice who wrote for the court, wrote that various guarantees create zones of privacy. Douglas cites a ton of amendments here, the first, the third, the fourth, the ninth, the fifth, saying they all guarantee privacy. And if a woman wants to use birth control in her own home, her privacy there should be protected. Privacy is important. Got it. But things get weird when you realize the word privacy. And is privacy mentioned anywhere in the Constitution? Absolutely not. Is nowhere to be found. The actual word privacy is written exactly zero times in the U.S. Constitution. And yet we all believe that we do, in fact, have that right. What to make of this? Well, in the Griswold case, Douglas offers the following explanation. Douglas wrote for the court that certain constitutional guarantees have penumbras formed by emanations from these rights that give them light and substance. Penumbras, emanations, light, substance. It's so, it almost sounds like I'm just so captivated because it just, it sounds so physical. Like, it doesn't sound that high-level law. It's like... It it does. Penumbra comes from two Latin words, meaning near shadow. So you're using a metaphor from the natural world to describe an idea. Justice William O. Douglas said that all our constitutional rights have penumbras of emanation stretching out into space. I imagine an exploding star, a supernova, this glowing white ball with light radiating out in every direction into the vastness of space. So according to him, while the law doesn't say anything about privacy explicitly, privacy is kind of contained in the space that the law emanates into. Or something? Hello. Hello, is this Dr. Krupp? It is, and I'm going to take you off of speakerphone. Okay, perfect. perfect. I think I'm going to take you off of speakerphone. (laughs) I am trying to take you off. Where is it? uh, This idea that we can understand the Ninth Amendment through like a cosmic metaphor? (laughs) No. It's so beautiful. Very weird headset. No. And yet, so vague. Like, every time I really try and wrap my head around it, it just... No, I think you're still... It kind of fuzzes out. And so, I thought, maybe I just need to understand what a penumbra actually is. So, I called up a guy who knows. Try it again. Hello? Yep, am I on speaker still? No longer. We do not understand how that happened. It is strictly magical. Uh, We're probably (laughs) in a... um, Black hole vortex. <laughs> this is Dr. Ed Krupp. Director of Griffith Observatory in Los Angeles. Dr. Krupp is an astronomer, knows a lot about penumbras, so I asked him for a definition. The penumbra is a zone of shadow outside of the main central shadow that is cast by uh, a celestial light like the sun. Uh, Think about a solar eclipse where the moon is casting a shadow on the Earth. 
The deep, dark center part of that shadow is called the umbra. And the penumbra is the less dark, outer, fuzzy edge of that shadow where the darkness isn't as deep. So it's kind of like the furry shadow on the edge of the dark shadow, the little fuzz towards the outside. My suspicion is that you've probably not seen a total solar eclipse. Nope, is that correct? I have not. I've seen a partial last year. Yeah, it doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> It, it feels like it counts. <laughs> the, 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 the fact is... Okay, whatever. I asked him, based on his understanding of penumbras and astronomy, what do you think Douglas meant when he said... Certain constitutional guarantees have penumbras formed by emanations from these rites that give them light and substance. Like, does that make sense to him as an astronomer? No. No, 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 no. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I certainly understand how you're saying about the law, but that's a different thing than the actual experience of the penumbra. So he says, I, sure, I, if you want to think about it, if if the law, if it's a light source, it would emanate light, which could create a shadow, but the shadow doesn't give the light its light in substance. It already has the light inside of it, and Hmm. You, you know, it's it's um, it's difficult for me to uh, endorse that uh, <laughs> that that analogy. Talking to Ed Krupp, I was like, "What the f- Douglas? What did you mean?" Does it surprise you that his metaphor doesn't hold up? No, not at all. This is David J. Garrow. Um, I'm the author of The Right to Privacy and the Making of Roe v. Wade. And he's written a lot about Justice Douglas. Given Justice Douglas's reputation, pulling these concepts uh, out of the air, almost literally out of the astronomical air, unfortunately, that was par for the course with Justice Douglas. Um, He He had this reputation for being a brilliant legal mind, but also kind of a jerk, Uh, not to mention a womanizer and kind of lazy. His former clerks said his opinions were, quote, drafted in 20 minutes, easy to ignore. There's another quote here that they were superficial or just plain sloppy. Like, that's strong. It's almost unprecedented for a justice's former clerks to speak critically, highly critically, uh, of the justice uh, subsequently in public. Part of me when I hear this thinks, like, seriously, Justice Douglas, you can't put in a little effort here? I guess I don't have a question attached to that, but do you do you kind of feel that? Like, does it feel... Oh, sure, sure. For example, it's been reported uh, that Justice Clarence Thomas uh, had a sign in his chambers at the Supreme Court saying, please don't emanate in the penumbras. But... All that said, when I when I hold all of this in my hands, the unenumerated rights, the penumbra, the moon, all of it, I feel like maybe Douglas was destined to fail. The Ninth Amendment is different. Unlike the first eight amendments that outline in incredible detail what Americans should expect of their new government, the Ninth Amendment comes floating in with all its astronomical vibes, gesturing dreamily at all the uncontainable, indomitable rights to which Americans can lay claim without ever being able to point to them in text. The founders of this country, one of the things they had in mind was that the law wasn't just a set of words or a set of rules. The law had a spirit. There was a spirit of the law and that there was something behind those words that you couldn't quite put your finger on, couldn't exactly name. So maybe Douglas failed because he was lazy, but maybe he failed because he had to. Maybe his failure is the whole point. Kelly Prime, with that audio liner note for the Ninth Amendment.
All right, moving right along. Tenth Amendment. The powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. This is often called the States' Rights Amendment. And the history behind it... It was hot in Tuscaloosa this morning. Very hot. Nearly 100 degrees. It's pretty dark. 70 years ago, states' rights were repeatedly invoked to say... Segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. No, the federal government cannot dismantle Jim Crow. It cannot mandate equality because we have a right to regulate in this area. That's the ugly history, according to Heather Gerken, dean of Yale Law School. But, she says... It's not the present. If you want to see where has most of the work been going on. The EPA wants to lower emission standards. One state, however, has dug in its heels. Massachusetts. California. The state of New York. And in terms of environmental reform, where has the most work been going on? Schools throughout Massachusetts are celebrating a day many thought might never come. In terms of moving forward LGBTQ issues. Legally getting married. That's been happening at the state and local level, and that definitely predates the Trump administration. So states' rights, this Tenth Amendment idea, cuts both ways. And maybe the deeper point is that, uh, you know, this push and pull between the federal government and the states, uh, you could argue it's fundamental to the way the country was built. It's part of the fundamental architecture. Sort of like if you go to uh, D.C. and and to the Capitol building, you look up at the uh, curved dome. In a basic dome, what you have is the weight of the dome itself, this sort of immense radial force pushing out away from the center, down against the stone walls, but the stone walls resist and push back up. And the only reason the thing doesn't fall on your head is because of those inner forces pushing against each other. To go slightly farther afield, there's a concept in architecture called tensegrity, where the integrity of the structure is the tension itself. That's what holds it up. The Tenth Amendment is evidence that the founders of this country had something like that in mind. I mean, these guys were builders. Washington, Jefferson, they wrote on and on about designing their own homes. And the republic that they designed for us is built on forces colliding, forces in a kind of balanced tension. And that's kind of what the Tenth Amendment is all about. Okay, I think we should all be here. Cool. Is everybody Emily, Rick? Yes, Emily, hello. Meet Rick. Hi. <laughs> nice to meet you guys. Thank you so much for that song. It's so amazing. Oh. I guess first, would you mind just introducing yourself? Uh, this is Rick Alverson. And I'm Emily Rick. And we're the band Lean Year. How tidy is. The band Lean Year chose the Tenth Amendment. Outside in. They spoke to Kelly Prime in the studio. How an excerpt. Could you tell me a little bit about the process of writing the song? Like if you were to paint a picture of like what idea came to you first? Uh, I mean, we, uh, we live in Virginia in Richmond, Virginia, and the, the idea of states' rights is a very volatile idea here. <laughs> I think we were thinking of the, the idea of the individual versus the collective, and it's sort of being this eternal struggle in the American brand of democracy. I think it was about um, envisioning sort of what the legal historical struggle um, might look like in the context of a relationship what an individual brings to a relationship and how an individual identifies within a relationship versus how they identify as a couple. And for me, the chorus is sort of the component of trepidation in that. Will you wait for the to 
Where you're, we put an end to me. You know, it can be a beneficial friction or it can be a, 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 a problematic, volatile sort of thing, you know? Yeah, and I think that we are, I mean, just so increasingly divided and polarized that that seems to sort of suck all of the nuance. Out of a conversation, um, in a way that just doesn't really allow us to hold a space for being individuals and being a collective at the same time. In a way that doesn't feel very fearful. a song uh, by the band Lean Year. I love that song. Um, written for the Tenth Amendment for our album called 27 The Most Perfect Album. You can listen to the full song, all the songs in their entirety at themostperfectalbum.org. I'm Jad Abumrad. This is More Perfect. We'll be back in a moment. Okay, Jad, More Perfect. We're marching through the amendments, listening to excerpts of songs inspired by these amendments from 27 The Most Perfect Album, and we're telling stories about the amendments. We've done nine. We've done ten. Now? Eleventh Amendment. Suits against states. The judicial power of the United States shall not be construed to extend to any suit in law or equity commenced or prosecuted against one of the United States by citizens of another state or by citizens or subjects of any foreign state. Okay, so this is another amendment that's little hard to parse. I mean, what it technically says, if you listen to it, the judicial power of the United States shall says not be something to to any suit about in how equity. a person who lives in one state, one of the United States by citizens like say Georgia, I don't know, uh, or by citizens cannot sue any foreign state. A, a different state. So someone who lives in Georgia can't sue the state of Florida. That's basically what it says. I mean, it gets more complicated, way more complicated, but at its base, it's this wonky little rule. And this is the 11th Amendment. Like you've got the Bill of Rights, which is 1 through 10, and it's filled with these blockbusters, the right to free speech, the right to bear arms, the right to a trial by a jury of your peers. And then you get this. Why? Again, to answer, or at least to come up with a satisfying answer, uh, it helps to free your mind from the literal. Here's Julia Longoria with more. It seems to me that the 11th Amendment is hugely complicated and difficult to teach even in law schools. Yes, I spent several weeks on it in, a, in an advanced upper class course. That's Susanna Sherry, a professor at Vanderbilt Law. So we're, we have the uh, unenviable challenge of tr- <laughs> trying, to, <laughs> trying to package this in like a three to five minute little <laughs> tap dance. <laughs> yeah, for so, the general public. Right, yeah. So <laughs> my, the, the, the metaphor that I've, <laughs> that I've tried is it seems maybe like it's the appendix of the Con- if the Constitution were a body, it's the appendix. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually n- not too bad. I woke up one morning feeling just a little bit queasy and nauseous. I thought maybe I had eaten something. Um, Dr. Heather Smith is an anatomy professor, and she was first introduced to her appendix when she was 12 years old, when it hurt like a b- The discomfort became more and more localized into the lower part of my right abdomen. And by the end of the day that day, I was in the emergency room having my appendix removed. This is how a lot of us encounter the appendix on its way out. And if you look at a picture of the appendix, it looks like this weird 
long wart coming out of our large intestine. Darwin, when he looked at it, called it a vestigial organ. Vestigial just means an evolutionary remnant, so something that was useful in the past that is no longer useful. Darwin's hypothesis was that in our ape ancestors, they were much more folivorous, meaning that they ate a lot more uh, grasses and leaves. And They were climbing up trees and eating leaves and branches, so they needed special enzymes in their body to digest that stuff. Those enzymes were stored in the appendix area, or at least that's the theory. But then over time, our diet changed. And so his hypothesis was that our large intestines essentially shrunk in size, and that when they shrunk, the appendix shrunk along with them. So the theory is that now it's just this deflated, useless organ past its prime that does nothing but cause problems. And for some people, it's tempting to see the 11th Amendment in kind of the same way, where it was once this super crucial thing, and now it causes pain. But you're saying it was crucial at one point? Yeah, actually. When? Why? Well, you have to remember, this amendment was drafted originally in 1793. That's Bradford Clark, a law professor from George Washington University. So only four years after the Constitution was adopted and only two years after the Bill of Rights was adopted. Keep in mind, the country is a baby at this point, like it's a newborn. And so most of the people who wrote the founding document had actually recently been British. And in Britain, there was this idea that you can't sue the king. The king has a dignity that would be affronted if he were uh, dragged into court by a commoner. And the founders of the United States, they took that same idea and put it into the U.S. Constitution. Most people took for granted that the federal government would be immune from suit. But it didn't seem like the states were going to get that same immunity. And states were like, No, no, no. We're not signing on to the Constitution if we don't get that immunity, too. Maybe it's hard for us in this modern... uh world to put ourselves back into the mindset of the people at the time. But I think the states were very proud of winning their independence. So in the Declaration of Independence, they declared themselves to be free and independent states. We don't think of this today, but the word state was the word that was used in international law to describe a sovereign nation. Hmm. And it's still used that way in other countries. And one of the prerogatives of sovereign states was not to be sued in its own courts or in the courts of another sovereign without its consent. And so that was the basic idea. States were never going to give up immunity. They would never sign on to the Constitution without it. So in some ways, the 11th Amendment kind of saved our Constitution. The states wouldn't be forced to pay back debts that they were not capable of paying. And because of that, the country could continue to exist. And so that was very important back then. I don't think we worry about that very much now. These days, according to Susanna Sherry... I I think uh, the 11th Amendment is mostly used to protect states from their own illegal actions. And I don't think that's a good thing. The 11th Amendment today causes all kinds of pain. If you happen to have a run-in with a state... The tribe says the lake is part of a watershed sacred to the Coeur d'Alene Indians. But, says the Supreme Court, the state can't be sued. You mean to tell me, even if these Medicaid recipients are right, that neener, 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 they can't sue you and hold you accountable and you're free to violate the law? Florida refused to negotiate with the Seminole tribe. And so the Seminole tribe tried to sue them in federal court. Supreme Court said, nope, they're immune. I feel that the people that were hurt from Smoking cigarettes should be compensated for it. Legal experts say that case will be difficult to make because the 11th Amendment protects states from federal lawsuits for monetary damages. This is why the 11th Amendment is so crazy. So that makes me think, like, should we just get rid of the 11th Amendment? Like, should we be going full appendectomy on this? Well, I I think... I think that might be a pretty good metaphor, (laughs) except that there is a dispute. It's as if there were a dispute among doctors about whether the appendix was actually a useful organ. Yes, there is. There absolutely is. (laughs) There is? Oh, I didn't know that. They've just come out with a study that says, like, actually, the appendix 
might be useful. So like when there's a time of turmoil in the stomach, as uh, they call it, like a diarrheal episode. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you want to use that on the podcast. Watch me. So I just want to kind of like walk through step by step uh, a diarrheal episode. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Heather Smith, again, is one of the people who discovered this. So let's say, for instance, you had um, a tourist who went to another country and got some kind of serious gastrointestinal issue and they had episodes of diarrhea. When your body's flushing everything out, the appendix actually has this kind of poetic, beautiful function. The appendix may serve as a safe house, kind of a reservoir for beneficial gut bacteria. So maybe the appendix isn't vestigial, like Darwin thought. The, the term that we use in, in evolutionary biology is called an exaptation. Hmm. So it's where a, a structure serves an adaptive function, but it's not its original function. In the same way, the 11th Amendment today looks very different than it did in 1793. That's because the Supreme Court expanded it. They said the 11th means a lot more than it says. It protects states against all kinds of suits. Of course, there are exceptions, but it means a lot of times a Floridian can't sue Florida for damages. It also might mean you can't sue a state that's choosing to be a sanctuary for immigrants. Depending on who you are, you might hate that. Or you might see it as a good thing. A reservoir for state power. A critical piece that finishes the federalism puzzle. The top of the Tenth Amendment dome, the penumbra of the Eleventh Amendment. Julia Longoria with that liner note for the Eleventh Amendment. Here's the song. comes from a guy named Kevin Patrick Sullivan who goes by the name Field Medic. I'm a sovereign state, your feds can't catch me. Sovereign state, your feds can't catch me. Sovereign state, your feds can't catch me. I'm gonna be the one to sentence me. I got a sovereign heart that's got no vacancy. Sovereign heart that's got no vacancy. Sovereign heart that's got no vacancy. And a self-love that's gonna set me free. Field Medic with a song for the 11th Amendment. You can check out that song and uh, Ninth Amendment song from the Caminas, 10th Amendment song from Linear, and of all the other artists that have written songs for this album, 27, the most perfect album, uh, about the amendments to the Constitution. You can check them all out at themostperfectalbum.org. Listen to them all. Uh, More Perfect is produced by me, Chad Abumrad, Susie Lechtenberg, Julia Longoria, Kelly Prime, Sarah Kari, and Alex Overington with help from Ellie Mistal, Michelle Harris, and David Gable, and Nora Keller. The voice that you heard reading the amendments for us, that is actor Jeffrey Wright. Huge thanks to him, and thanks to you for listening. Okay, we'll see you next time.